Welcome to Open Heart Conversations. I'm Reverend Dr. Jose Miguel Roman, your host and spiritual counsel at the United Palace of Spiritual Arts. Today, I have the pleasure of uh, two co-hosts. First, Bishop Heather Shea, who is spiritual director and uh, the chief operating officer of the United Palace of Spiritual Arts. Welcome back, Heather. Thank you, Jose. Great to be here. And uh, a very special treat for her very first time at Open Heart Conversations is Reverend Rene Rossi. Uh, Reverend Rene is the um, Spiritual Arts Associate at the United Palace of Spiritual Arts, and she is also an ordained spiritual spiritualist minister. Uh, Reverend Rene, welcome to Open Heart Conversations. Thanks so much, Jose. I'm really excited to be here. We're excited to have you here. And today we have a very, very special program. As uh, Heather likes to tell everyone, it is a program I have been looking forward to doing for a couple of years now. We will be exploring an ancient and remarkable spiritual path known as spiritualism. And with us is a very, very, very wonderful guest um, who will be essentially facilitating our exploration of this spiritual path, the Reverend Stephen Robinson. Reverend Steve, welcome to Open Heart Conversations. Thank you, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, let me tell our, our viewers a little bit about you, by the way. You've got an extraordinary background. Reverend Stephen Robinson is the founder and executive director of Holistic Studies Institute. He has a BS in psychology and has studied with uh, the uh, Morris Pratt Institute. He's a certified psychic medium, a certified intuitive consultant, and an ordained spiritualist minister. For over 42 years, he has maintained a successful practice as a psychic consultant and clinical hypnotherapist. His clientele includes TV and movie stars, celebrities and fashion, architecture, and many other professions. He is a native New Yorker. Stephen, um, Reverend Stephen Robinson has given readings in person and by phone to people all over the world. Should also be noted that he is a teacher to both uh, Reverend Rene and Bishop Heather. Now, Stephen, I'll begin by asking, um, I guess the easiest question, what is spiritualism? How would you define spiritualism? And that's it's a, a simple question with a difficult answer. Right. And the reason is that spiritualism is a religion, with a capital S, a religion, that um, has a lot of diversity in terms of spiritual paths, uh, what traditions people bring into spiritualism. And spiritualism is kind of like a rolling religion where as we grow as a society, as people learn and, and we experience more with uh, our own experiences, our own spiritual experiences, we weave those into what we know about science and philosophy. So it brings all kinds of people together. Fundamentally, we agree on nine principles, which we call the Declaration of Principles. And essentially, um, they're a creed, uh, but they do change. And they change at our national conventions every year. So you may have some modification of some sort. Um, for example, one of our principles is we believe that the human soul lives on after death. And uh, although it's not word exactly like that, um, the word human was taken out about five years ago because of the belief that other um, beings, other species on this planet, also have spirit that is eternal. So they took it out. Now it's just spiritual. And Stephen, you just mentioned spirit and soul. What's the difference or similarity? That's a good question. Um, we kind of look at soul kind of like Jung did, uh, in the sense that the soul's purpose is to individualize and to add to the collective and receive from the collective. So it's a circular kind of um, rolling pattern. With the soul, one could say that the soul is your personality. Um, who you are at this particular time um, and place. Um, the spirit, on the other hand, 
is more connected to the infinite. Um, so if we were to diagram it like sort of um, a cone, at the top we would say that the widest section would be spirit, and as we get to the more narrow section we would say soul, and then when we get to the, the point of uh, incarnation we would say body. So there's a trinity in spiritualism, spirit, soul, and body. Thank you. hope that helps. And Stephen, where does spirit come from? Yeah, well, there's this big manufacturing plant up in the heavens <laughs> to churning out souls. I mean, some people think that. Um, we think from what we've learned from spirit people and Mind you, knowledge is limited only because of frequency. Um, but we've learned that um, we're eternal, which means that not only eternal, the definition of the word is to go all the way back in time and come all the way back around again to the present. So um, when we ask a question like that, it presupposes that there's a beginning and an end to spirit. And in spiritualism, there is no beginning or end to spirit. It's hard for us to conceptualize that because we're taught in other religions, um, it's very linear. Um, there's the beginning, and as it says in the Bible, in the beginning, <laughs> and then it talks about the end days. Um, spiritualism doesn't accept that. Um, obviously, the universe began with the Big Bang, so we can't argue that there was a beginning but that doesn't address the spiritual part of our existence. That only ex ex it tells us of our physical part of our existence. Spiritualism believes that um, of a, in a biocosmic universe, that there is life everywhere. And um, the universe is so large, the physical universe is so large, um, we have so much to learn about how spirit connects to the universe itself. Um, and what kind of a role does that play in the universe? Um, so, when I look out at the universe, I study it, I read, I watch documentaries, um, or go to a lecture, um, or just go outside and look up at the stars. I, I think about how beautiful it is physically, and I also feel the beauty of it on a spiritual level. And it's that dimension of spirituality from which spiritualism and its teachings come from. Stephen, um, you, you said that there's, a, there's this trinity of spirit, soul, and body. Yes. In, in the Hindu faith, there is this belief in Brahma and Atman. Mm -hmm. Brahma is the great spirit, mm -hmm. right? The great soul, mm -hmm. God, if you will. Atma is an a element of Brahma, but it is the individual element. Yes. It is, right? Is that the distinction then between spirit and soul that's being made in the spiritualist movement? Um, I think on a surface level, I would agree with that in, as a spiritualist. Um, I think if you get into the, the weightier doctrines on that, I think that we would have to talk about that. But yeah, I think basically that's similar. Are, are, all, are all spirits... Um, in individual human beings that were once um, born and, and, and had normal human life and then transitioned? Well, we, we are Earth-centric. You know, this is the center of our world, the Earth, as human beings. Um, but um, there, there is a, a higher existence uh, to us. Um, so um, I think that the, the soul is, represents a journey for us on Earth. Um, is there life on other planets? Um, statistically, there must be. Um, and is there a spirit connection to those people um, or uh, those individuals? Yes, there's some kind of spiritual co connection. Um, I like to use the analogy of, um, of fairies, gnomes, um, unicorns, um, things like that. Uh, think about a unicorn. It's a horse with a, with a horn at the end of it. Where do we come up with these things? Um, my thought is um, that if something exists somewhere in the universe, through our intuition, we can attach to that frequency and become very creative and pull things out of that. And so 
when you ask, or if someone asks, where does a unicorn come from? It comes out of the mind. And where does the mind get its information from? We just make things up. Um, maybe our imagination is inspired by information that we're not aware of consciously in the universe. It's interesting because you seem to be hinting at the fact that we have a connection. We as human beings living in this plane of existence do have a connection to spirit or spirits, and which again is, is core to your belief system. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to communicate with spirits? What's its value? Uh, well, <laughs> there's four major reasons which I can give you that are the, the party line. And the first is to learn moral lessons from spirit people. And by moral lessons, I don't mean conservative, traditional moral values and things of that sort, but uh, like what kinds of actions have an effect on other people and how does that impact our own spirituality? Um, so we can learn that from the other side. Um, by example, they will say, this is how I live my life, and these are the results of my experience now that I'm on the other side. So we can learn about morality or karma um, and our own spirituality from them. Secondly, they often uh, want to teach us something. They want to share information with us. Um, if I were to go to China right now, I don't know Mandarin. Um, I don't know about the currency. I wouldn't know where to go or how to read signs. So I would want to prepare myself so that when I arrive, I'm prepared, I'm, I'm able to function. And so that's another reason why. They tell us of the, the laws and the structure of the spirit world and how it's arranged so that we kind of have a little bit of a head start when we cross over. And we kind of know what to expect. And that takes a lot of the stress and fear out of dying. So that for that reason, um, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my parishioners, I was a pastor of a church for 20 years, and one of my parishioners was in the hospital, um, stage four cancer, and he was basically dying. Um, the family called me in and I went in to visit him. And when I entered the room, before I even saw him in the bed, I noticed up in the upper right corner, a vision of a face of a woman with a smile on her. And she gave me the distinct feeling that it was his mother. So I found him in the room and um, we greeted each other and uh, he was in a, a diminished state but really able to have a conversation. And um, he said, are you feeling anyone here with me? I said, yes, I am. I said, I'm, I'm feeling the mother. And he smiled. As, I'm, I'm a dying man. He smiled. And he said, I feel her here too. I see her here too. She's over there. And I thought, great, that's my confirmation. We're both on the same page. We agree with each other. She must be here, uh, if that's the case. Now, one could argue, well, you know, it's his wishful thinking, and it's only you know, my desire to comfort him in some way. One could argue that, but I doubt that. I don't think that's a very good argument. Um, another one is that, uh, and this sort of, sort of comes off of what I just said, another one is that um, when someone dies, um, human beings tend to want to continue their relationship with the one that they lost. And that's, you know, they go through a grieving process, and it's very painful. And invariably what happens, they'll call for a reading, and when the reading comes up, a repetitive theme comes up in every reading, and that is, I'm your mother, I'm your father, I am dead, but I want to continue my relationship with you. How can we do this? I can visit you in your dreams. You can go to a psychic development class and develop mediumship so that you can receive my thoughts more clearly and understand uh, the difference between your own thought and a thought that comes from the other side. So it's, it's not the same kind of a relationship, but it's a connection. Um, and there's a lot of value in that. Um, the greatest comfort that you can give a person is that they're going to rendezvous with their loved ones when they pass on. Um, and that they, those who are left behind um, have the faith and or knowledge that their loved ones are still with them. So they'll attend a seance, uh, we call it a message meeting, for the purpose of getting a message from one of their loved ones who crossed over. And um, in some ways they feel um, that when they attend a seance, not only are they receiving information from the other side, from their, their loved one, but that because it's such a psychically charged environment, that the 
um, person sitting there in human form feels like they can talk to their loved one and their loved one is hearing them back. So there's a lot of comfort that comes with spirit communication and knowledge. Um, think about uh, if, if you could communicate with someone who had passed away 1,500 years ago. Imagine meeting somebody on the earth, a human being who was 1,500 years old and was completely with it. What kinds of questions would you ask that person? What kind of knowledge, firsthand knowledge, could you get from that person uh, going back 1,500 years? Uh, there's a lot of value to that. Now, we, we don't have anyone, to our knowledge, that's 1,500 years old who's still alive on this planet. Right. But there are spirit people who are 1,500 years old and older who can communicate with us, and we can learn a great deal from them. Renee, I think you have a question that's related to this. Yeah, yeah Stephen, um, I was hoping you could give some examples of some important truths that we have learned from spirit, um, maybe that are widely accepted by spiritualists. Sure. One of the truths is that um, one does not become immediately transformed after death. Uh, that you, you maintain your own personality. Um, and that um, gradually evolves as it, as it would if you had lived on the earth. Um, we go through different developmental stages. So there are different developmental stages in the spirit world as well. Um, sometimes people refer to them as planes of consciousness or planes of spheres of existence. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. I, I think it does. Or if there's something um, we've learned from spirit that has sort of been a, a foundational part of spiritualism, like truths they have given us that have really... Well, the, yeah, the, the fundamental truth is that there's life after death. I mean, just about every religion... Um, with the exception maybe a few, but just about every religion, it, it, the religion itself explains that there's life after death. It gives hope to people. This is one of the reasons why people gravitate toward religion. It, it makes sense of things that don't make sense to us. It gives us comfort. And especially, it's the issue of life after death. And spiritualism offers proof in that through its phenomena, not, not through... Uh, just reading out of a book or just doing some type of research, which is being done, but through demonstrating uh, mediumship. Um, my grandfather uh, passed away of um, lung cancer, and my grandmother was in the hospital room with him. And I stood at the foot of the bed as they were holding hands as he was dying, and he looked up at me with the most serious look. And this is a man who was Roman Catholic all of his life. And he said, Stephen, you, you really believe in life after death, don't you? Because he knew I was a pastor of the spiritual church. And I looked at him and I called him Pa. I said, no, Pa, I don't, I don't just believe it. I know it. And I wasn't being arrogant. I was just being confident based upon my experiences. So the experiences themselves are something that, you know, you know no one can take away from you. They're, they're, they're so palpable. It, it, it just can't be taken away. Stephen, is, is the primary belief of spiritualists the belief in spirit? Yes, um, but I would say it's not fundamentally a belief in spirits, plural, but spirit as in the divine. Um, sometimes we refer to the divine as infinite intelligence because spiritualism um, tries to move away from uh, an anthropomorphic deity um, and really kind of challenges its adherence to expand their concept of God as much as possible. And this is a challenge for a lot of people. My own uh, concept of God, I mean, from the time I started in spiritualism up until today, is constantly being revised um, and, and thought about. Um, I've um, currently been, been listening to um, atheists, uh, atheistic le lectures. And one of the points that they bring up is that if you're a Christian, you believe in the Christian God or Judeo-Christian God, um, you, um, you're an atheist to all other religions. So you don't believe in Zeus. <laughs> right. um, so this is why some people say that spiritualists are, are atheists or they don't have a God, which is not true. Uh, our God is 
I shouldn't say our God or a God, uh, is not a person on a throne, um, is infinite everywhere, um, breathing, if you will, its energy, life, and mostly its love for the universe. So, so to spiritualists, the word God has meaning. There is something, it's pointing to something that's real. Yes. Um, infinite intelligence is the technical term that it's most spiritualists will use. And the purpose of that is to get away from the personalized um, deity. When I say personalized, I mean like human form. Mm -hmm. And help people to understand that, that there's a broader, deeper um, non-entity, if you will, um, that exists throughout the universe. Um, I once attended a spiritualist church when I was a student, and uh, I went with my mentor, who had been the pastor of that church in Springfield, Massachusetts. And there was a student minister uh, that was giving the lecture that day on the platform. And she said, unfortunately, spiritualism doesn't have a personal deity. And I just sat in the pew and I just cringed. And I thought to myself, if I could just tape her mouth up. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I had that vision in my mind just taping her mouth up because that's not true. Uh, spiritualism looks at God as not necessarily individual personality, but all personality. And when you take a look at the universe, or even just the, the earth, the way it's arranged, it looks to me like there's some kind of intelligence behind all this that's operating in this, and that we call God. So, so in spiritualist circles, what is the understanding of the purpose of human life? Ah, well, that deals more with our own individual growth. Um, I think that spiritualism believes in human solidarity. Um, it, it also believes the purposes of life, two main fundamental purposes, to learn and to love. And... Uh, that's quite a, a big job in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, oftentimes people who have near-death experiences will talk about how when they go into the light, the light asks them questions. And it will ask them, what have you learned so far? And have you loved? And um, usually the person who has a near-death experience will say, well, not enough. And then the light in some way communicates to them, well, it's not your time. You need to go back and finish your job. So it appears that uh, even people, 8, 10 million people at this point who had near-death experiences are telling us these things. There's some value to that. And especially because it's transcultural. I mean, they've done studies in, in um, remote villages in China where the people are illiterate, they don't have Wi-Fi or they don't have computers or cell phones or television sets. Um, and they have the same experiences that we have. It, it, it's a human spiritual phenomenon. And I think that adds to the um, knowledge that there's life after death. Now, one could argue that, okay, well, that's, this is all a function of the brain and the body. It's all neurobiology and, uh, and all that. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. But then there's something beyond that. Um, and that's, that's what spiritualism talks about. So might it be appropriate to say that in spiritualist circles, many hold the proposition that the purpose of life is a kind of evolution into love? Yes, but love in, in, in its broadest sense, and not necessarily being in love with someone, mm -hmm. um, but rather understanding and learning what love is within oneself. Um, and then able to express that through kindness or compassion to others. Stephen, I was hoping you could explain what spirit guides are, and um, do you believe in them? Um, my first experience with a spirit guide was when I was 13 years old. And uh, I would come home from school um, and just about every day meditate, um, lie in my bed and just go into a state of meditation. And one day, a spirit guide appeared to me. I didn't know what it was. It, was, it was, wasn't a phantom-like person, but it was sort of like a, a, a mental image that was projected onto the wall. And he presented himself in a very high chair and exaggeratedly large frame and said to me, 
um, and this is when I was in Albany, and said to me, someday you're going to go to New York City, and you're going to help a lot of people make a name for yourself. What did I know at 13 years old? I didn't know what he was talking about. But it was a prophecy about my own life. Um, and that guide has been with me. I'm going to be 65 next month. That guide has been with me all these years. Um, I do believe in spirit guides. I do question people when they say that they have a wolf or an eagle as a spirit guide. Um, I think that those are representative of the qualities or the attributes that the spirit guides represents. Uh, so if one's idea of a wolf being perhaps strong uh, or power, then that guide may be uh, emanating that power or uh, letting you know that they're going to be there for you as a power uh, source so that you can rely on them for power when you need it. Um, so there's, there's all different reasons for spirit guides. Now, in, in, in terms of the religion of spiritualism, there is a service, a consecration service that we have for young children. And there's actually four entities involved. There's uh, usually two what we call sponsors or godparents. And then there are, uh, we also ask that spirit guides be, um, take on the, the baby or the child uh, for their life to to help them and guide them along and be with them. So we sort of have spirit guides are like a godparents. However, they're not personal to us because they have a professional relationship with us. So it's sort of like having a relationship with your therapist. Okay, they know how your mind works and they know how to communicate with you and they know how you're going to react to the stimulus that they create for you. And Renee, you also had a question regarding healing and I'd love for you to have the opportunity to ask that question. Yes, Stephen, can you speak to the importance of um, the act of healing and of healers in spiritualism? Yeah, I think healing is essential. And this, this really addresses the issue of uh, human suffering. That, that spiritual, one of spiritualism's goal is to relieve human suffering. So we do that through healing. Um, and we use uh, what is, has become called subtle energy. Uh, this is not heat, it's not light, it's not electromagnetism, and it's not electricity. What is it? Well, we don't know, but we know that it's something. And the American Nurses Association is using the term subtle energy as a scientific phrase. Um, so we use that energy and we manipulate it in the aura or around the person. Sometimes people can be touched, and through touch healing, there's a value to that or just by hovering your hand over a person's physical body. That, that energy can be used by the body itself. It draws it in. I've had experiences where people, um, for example, someone has an ulcer, and I've gone over their aura, and all of a sudden when I get to the area of the stomach, my hand will just fall right into the aura, like it's being drawn in, and, and the energy is being sucked right from my hand right into that area. Um, the body has an intelligence. It can heal itself. A physician can't heal you, they can facilitate healing. Um, a surgeon can't heal you, they can facilitate healing. But if your body doesn't have the capacity to heal itself, when you go into a recovery room after surgery, you're just gonna bleed to death. So your body knows to start to you know, coagulate the blood and start to create you know, scar tissue and heal up. Um, and so um, that energy um, has been researched as well. They find, for example, that post-surgical patients will recover more quickly and easily with far less stress if they've had a therapeutic touch treatment afterward. Now, so, you mentioned the term uh, aura. What's, what's an aura? Yeah. Can uh, other people see them? Or, I know some people sometimes say, I see colors around you. What, can you explain what that is? Mm -hmm. um, for about 25 years, Dr. Al Holstrom uh, worked with our institute. Um, he was the chair of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences in SUNY, SUNY Albany. And he invented uh, something called the Curlian motion picture camera. And uh, the Curlians were um, a couple. They were farmers and researchers. And they stumbled upon um, a way to um, find uh, disease in plants. Um, in Russia, it was a very difficult time. Back in the 1930s, um, people were still hungry. And so, you know, they had... Uh, problems growing plants. Anyway, um, they created something called, what today is called a Curlian camera. 
And instead of using light to illuminate an image, they use electricity. So when they opened the shutter of the camera, they didn't let light in, they only let electrons in from electricity, which bounced off the object and created um, an aura around the fingertips that are being photographed. So this is something that we know exists. Uh, the question is, can we see it with our naked eye? And the answer to that is yes. We've done some, some fun research. It's not, nothing published, but it's fun research with Dr. Holstrunk. And we would have a group of students watch or stare at someone on a, at a screen and look at their aura and say, okay, what do you see? And then he would take notes. The person that was, was being observed would go in the other room and they would have a picture of their aura taken through Curlian process. The following week we'd come back and we logged all the information and we were right about 90% of the time, if not all, every time. And that was really objective proof that the aura exists. Not only that, we have at, at our institute, we have thousands of, of uh, Curlian slides of how the aura changes each time we do something. And also how the aura has a basic form like our face, like the expression of our face is just, this is the way it is, okay? But it constantly changes as I speak, as I look around the room, uh, as my mood changes, and then it goes back to its normal shape again. And the aura is the, way, the same way. It seems to have the same form. So we, we had a lot of fun in these classes. In one class um, on the aura, we um, had someone bring a, a jug of wine and he had a designated driver, so we had him well taken care of. But it's all for, you know, for research purposes. And we took a picture of his aura before um, drinking, and it was sort of like a pink and blue, a little bit of green in it, and some normal colors, nothing unusual. Um, and then uh, he drank 16 ounces of wine, and he was, not, he was told not to eat dinner before he came to class. So this went right into his system. Uh, so we took a picture of his aura shot, and it showed a lot of red in it. And you could still see the background colors from the original uh, picture, but now the red had shown up. What is that? Okay, we waited about 15 minutes more. He went back in to get his aura shot taken, and this time the red had turned to a muddy brown. <sighs> now we think about alcohol and its effect on the body. They say that it's a stimulant and a depressant. Perhaps what we're photographing with the red is the stimulation that initially comes with alcohol and then the depressing part that comes after it reaches that peak point may be the brown that we're looking at. Another example, um, a man who's a physician who did a laboratory research also smoked cigarettes. So we took a picture of his aura before and after smoking. Um, again, the before picture was what normally shows up in a person, pink, blue, uh, you know, pastel kinds of colors. And he came back in after his cigarette, and we took a picture of his aura. And um, Dr. Hallstrom called me back into, his, um, into the room where he was doing the photograph, and he said, um, he said, I want you to see something. And he showed me the slide of his aura, and it looked brown with reddish, um, not quite red, more like a, a, a burgundy color, dots around it. And he said, usually we see this in people that have cancer. I said, "Oh well, I don't think I don't think we we need to tell him that. That's that, you know, um, he's a doctor, and uh, I, I just didn't feel like it was the right thing to, to do. I don't regret it. Um, but he died three months later of lung cancer. He was undiagnosed, and apparently he didn't have enough symptoms. So that was back probably at about 1980. <laughs> so." Um, yeah, the aura exists, um, and the question is, are we able to see it? And I, I do believe that we are able to see it. I remember my very first time seeing it. Um, I was in a, I, I was getting a part-time job, and it was at Sears. And I was probably about 18, 19 years old. And the woman who was speaking, she was speaking on a microphone, and she was lecturing in front of all of us. And she was about 20 feet away. And as I looked at her, with the blue background, I could see her entire aura. It's just like the aura that you see in uh, the, that's in the illustration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, concentric circles, and then rays of light coming out. It was amazing. And she was just an ordinary woman just teaching in Sears. 
uh, doing corporate training. She wasn't a god or a deity or anything. So I think that there's a lot more to who we are than what we see in the mirror. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> great, great answer, I'll back to you. Absolutely. Stephen, um, this all raises, we're, we're doing this exploration together, what ra it raises a question for me uh, about how you got involved in spiritualism. Um, I would say, first of all, I was brought up in a home that was very favorable toward spiritualism, unlike many homes back then. I remember um, sitting at the breakfast table at 10 years old and my parents talking about um, the experience they had the night before. And my mother said there was a woman in the bedroom when she woke up in the middle of the night and she was dressed in a, a wedding dress that looks like it was from the 1860s. My father said, that's unusual because I had a dream last night. I was a Civil War soldier in my past life. I'm 10 years old listening to this, and this is like normal behavior. This is like normal to me. It wasn't until I started to express myself more in school about these things that I realized how much ignorance there was out there. Um, not bad ignorance, but just, and, and also um, hatred uh, toward people who were spiritualists. I mean, we were called evil, uh, working with the devil, um, uh, just har they say horrible things, or they did. Uh, it's not like that anymore, thank God. You also call yourself a clairvoyant. Um, is that the same um, as being a spiritualist, or what is their clairvoyant? Yeah, not every spiritualist is clairvoyant. Um, but a clairvoyance literally means to see beyond um, your physical sight. It's, it's a, I sort of see it as an augmentation of my sight. My, where my physical sight leaves off, then I'll go inward to see what kind of visions I can see. Um, and that can give me information. So uh, clairvoyance is just something, it, it's, it's a way of visualizing. Um, and it can be in your mind's eye. Or it can sometimes and rarely be seen as a projection of what's in your mind in the environment. So you get a, a contextual understanding of what it is that you're receiving. Well, are, are psychics and mediums the same thing? No, no. Um, a psychic is one whose um, energy um, is able to read mundane things on the earth. For example, a psychic can say, I see you getting a promotion in six months. I see you having a baby in 10 years. I'm making predictions about your future and about your life and also going retrospectively into your life. I see that you've done whatever. Um, so it's mainly about their life on the earth, their journey. Um, a medium is um, more connected to a spirit and relaying what that spirit is saying. Okay. Um, Example, I had a woman that came to me for a reading a number of years ago. She had an Irish surname. And she asked me if her wedding would go well. She was engaged and she was to be married in a couple of weeks. If the, how the wedding would go. As a physical person, I thought, I don't know. So I closed my eyes and, and tapped into my clairvoyance. And all of a sudden I saw a man and uh, he said, I'm her father. And I've just come back from her wedding. And then he held his hand out like this to show me what the wedding looked like. And there was her and her fiance uh, standing on a platform with a chuppah over the top of it. I thought, she's Irish. She must be Catholic or Protestant. Why is there a chuppah in this wedding? And the father didn't answer me. He just smiled at me as if to say, you're going to find out in a minute. So I told her my whole vision. I said, um, he told me that he's already been to your wedding and he's come back to the present to tell you what it's like. And he showed me a chuppah and I don't understand it because you have an Irish surname. Oh, she said, well, my husband, my future husband is Jewish. And she said, I've just converted. And so we're having a Jewish ceremony. So his prediction, when he said to me, you'll find out, I found out when I told her. Now, I, I, take, I, I walk away from an experience like that really, really enriched. And try to let other people know that they can do that too. Life starts to change when, 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 uh, when you have these experiences. Say, say a little bit more about that and talk a little bit more about being a medium. Like, like you, when I was very young, I was always accepted that I saw things, that my family saw things. And uh, I think as Jose mentioned uh, earlier, may not, but Renee and I are both students, students of yours, and, and this can be developed. But 
but is everybody a medium or if I think I'm a medium, how do I develop that and, and what's really involved and, and are some people better mediums than others or how, how does that all work? Mediumship, um, just communication with the dead, mediumship is um, something that can be trained. Um, now, of course, it, it's a skill. So it requires practice as any skill does. It's just like playing the piano. Um, the more you play, the more you practice, the better at it you get. Um, I tell my students, they, they always, um, you know, they, they, they revere my mediumship. Like, oh, this guy is so mediumistic. And I try to tell them, look, you're just as mediumistic as I am. It's just that I've been playing the piano longer than you have. I've had more practice at this. Give yourself more time, it'll happen. And so what we do is we inject exercises that target certain psychic and mediumistic faculties so that you can develop them as a skill. And we do that progressively over a nine-month period of time. And within nine months, uh, we can train someone to give, um, to, to give a private reading, a one-on-one -on -one private reading to another person. There is, an, uh, there is a scientific part of this, too, that I'm intrigued with, and that is brain research. Um, it looks like we're hardwired to be mediums and psychics. Um, years ago, they did work with the right temporal lobe, and they uh, stimulated this, and when they did, they could artificially create through this um, near-death experiences and telepathy. So uh, there's some, you know, how science works, you know, when you'll... One group will do a, a research study, publish it, and then another group tries to disprove it, and they go back and forth on this. But there, I've been reading the literature, and it looks like there's some type of brain activity uh, that occurs. The brain changes when someone is communicating with spirits. And so now that we're able to um, illuminate the brain, we can see those changes. Um, you could argue, well, it's the mediumship or the exercise of that state of mind that's causing that a change in the brain, or is it the change in the brain that's causing that? Um, we don't know. As with any subject, the, the more you delve into it, the more questions you have than answers. If somebody is sort of coming into this, and that well, you know, Stephen said I, I, I'm probably a medium because we have these skills. Uh, people ask me sometimes, you know, I, I think I see my mother. Could that really be it? Or I see her in a dream. How do how do spirits? As, as you're developing this skill, how can you start to know if you really have any connection? Good question. Um, well, let's just think about the difference between your own personal thought that just comes up out of your mind normally and a thought that we could call a psychic impression, meaning that it's coming from outside somewhere. Uh, maybe it's an impression that you're getting from your environment. Maybe it's an impression you're getting from a spirit. The characteristics of those impressions are that, let's say you're watching the game on TV or you're really into a book and your mind is really intensely uh, active. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, in the middle of that, interrupting your normal train of thought is the thought of a spirit loved one. And then you stop, and, it, and it, in, in the mind, you stop and think, what was that? Why did I think about that all of a sudden? And then you check your environment. Is there anything around me that would stimulate that thought or remind me of that person? And you answer the question, and it's no. Well, then you could probably conclude that that's a spirit trying to communicate with you. And they will come through to us when our mind is um, the quietest, in meditation, in the deepest forms of meditation or trance, um, especially in, when we sleep. And the way you can tell the difference between a dream and a visitation during sleep is a dream, you're kind of participating in the dream, or you might be witnessing the dream. Um, you might not remember it. It might not be that eventful to you or that memorable. On the other hand, a visitation is something that's almost as good as a lucid dream. And you wake up in the dream, you feel a lot of emotion. Usually there's a lot of love. There's a lot of connection with that other person. Um, when you wake up, that feeling continues to stay with you as if you had actually gone to their home and they gave you a big hug and you felt that love. And when you got home, you still felt it afterward. That's a visitation in a dream. Wonderful. That's, that's very helpful. To say a little bit too, because I know that sometimes I will um, kind of see my mother, but sometimes I'll actually smell her or hear her. What are the different ways that the spirit might come to me or someone? Um. Well, parapsychologists, who are the people who do the research 
on mediums and psychics. Uh, generally um, match uh, the psychic senses with our physical senses. So they'll say for every physical sense you have, for example, for vision, you have clairvoyance. Uh, for um, hearing, you have clairaudience. Um, so there's different channels or different senses. So when you say you can smell a spirit, um, they sometimes will give us smells as ways to identify themselves. My grandmother, for example, I loved her dearly, and um, she would be doing things, and I would just hang out with her. I, I, lo I just loved hanging out with her. She had really good energy. And sometimes she comes to me, and I know it's her, and only her, because I remember growing up, she used to smoke Winston cigarettes and wear Lily of the Valley perfume. And the combination of the smell was so unique, it's unforgettable, for me anyway. Um, so whenever I get that smell, I know she's with me. So sometimes they'll use any means possible to get you to know who they are. And if your mind is open enough to receive and it's trained to, to get those subtle cues and then interpret them, then you've got a communication going and possibly a relationship. Great. Now, this isn't the kind of relationship that someone who's experiencing severe psychosis has. This is non-pathological. Mm -hmm. um, there's a man that walks up and down my street, young man, probably in his 20s, that very loudly is having an argument with someone. And he's not using any uh, earbuds or phone or anything else. He's just talking to someone he's imagining. That's not what we do. This is a, this is a very, very healthy form of communication. We, in, in this conversation, we've, we've used three words. We've used the word clairvoyant, psychic, medium, and we've explored these. I know that you teach intuition, the use of intuition. And I'm, I, I've, I've asked myself as I explored, frankly, and, and did research on you, I kept asking myself, what is the relationship, if any, of intuition to these other gifts of clairvoyance, psychic, mediumship? Um, is there a relationship between intuition and these gifts? Um. The intuition is about feelings. So it is part of mediumship. So for example, if, if a spirit comes into um, an environment and the medium starts to pick up on them, um, the intuition are the feelings that they're getting from the spirit that they can communicate to the recipient of the message. Um, lay people who are not spiritual say, for example, um, we all have intuition. And we probably use it without even being conscious of it. But intuition leads us, in, leads us with our feelings. Um, so it speaks to feelings. So I think that's, that's, the, uh, that's why psychics and mediums often will use the word intuitive. For example, we have one man who's certified through us, and he calls himself an intuitive medium instead of a psychic medium. So he's using the word interchangeably with psychic. Um, but I would say that it's part of the psychic um, feelings that we get. And we don't always know where they're coming from. Um, sometimes intuition can be confusing. Um, years ago, back in the uh, 1990s, um, Psychology Today um, had an article in it. And it was about intuition. And it was um, written, it was written based on a study um, that was conducted by a psychiatrist and a psychologist and their team. And they developed a test. They called it the IQ test, the intuition quotient. And they said it was a valid test. And they actually put the test in the magazine itself so that you could take it and see how intuitive you were. That was in 1990, 30 years ago, right? <laughs> what year is this? <laughs> It's really interesting because I, 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 you, you're obviously kind of inviting us, it seems to me, to consider the possibility that there are aspects to our consciousness that we don't always explore and that's available to all of us. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that maybe there are some folks who have more gifts in those areas than others, like mathematics, for example, right? Mm -hmm. I was able to do math all the way up to advanced calculus. Okay. Nevertheless, I will never be 
uh, an Albert Einstein, who literally was able to see and experience the world mathematically. So there are people, it, all of us can do some level of mathematics. In fact, all of us can be trying to do very high levels of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Some of us have more gifts in it than others. Is it possible, is it possible that all of these gifts you're, you're speaking to, that we have some access to them? Some have more, others have a little less, but we all have access to them. Yes, the access is dependent upon your brain, your mind, uh, your conditioning, uh, your environment. Uh, a lot of things have impact on that. Yeah, uh, that's one of my greatest challenges as, as a teacher in a, a psychic development class is to help people to overcome the negative conditioning that they have about this. They desire it, they want it so badly, and yet they're subconscious mind is saying, no, this isn't right, this isn't good. And I try to do little exercises where it draws some of those thoughts that they have about this that are negative out. So they hear themselves saying it. And we talk about that. So um, it helps. It helps. And yeah, Stephen, talk about that briefly, because I think that's important. Uh, when I've worked with people, they're, you know, they're kind of afraid. And so, you know, Hollywood has made it very scary. And there's, some, you know, all this movie that's scary stuff. Um, but I don't find it frightening. And how do you help people see that it really isn't something to be afraid of? Um, I, I ask people to uh, come to a seance or a message circle. And um, it's the easiest way. It's the most inexpensive way to get a little taste of it. And um, if they're afraid, I, I say to them, well, sit next to me. There's 25 people in the room. Just sit right here next to me. Uh, and they feel more comfortable. They think, well, this guy knows what he's doing, so I might as well sit here. Um, so sometimes just doing that in, in terms of where you put a person in a room. In terms of communicating with them, um, I find the underlying um, issue that most people have that is an obstruction is the fear of losing one's mind. Um, I've never realized that there was such a fear until I got into this work, um, that people are afraid of, of, of losing their mind. Like, uh, you know, we hear about Alzheimer's and all sorts of mental illness. And so they think, well, you know, if I'm seeing something that's not, not there, I must be crazy. And this is, a, this is a downward spiral to losing my own mind. And actually the opposite is true. You're exercising your mind more. You're, you're, you're making yourself stronger on that level. And you're empowering yourself on multi-levels. So there, there is definitely nothing to be afraid of. Um, some people come in with, uh, with some uh, ideas that are not a part of spiritualism, such as uh, the idea of curses, um, evil spirits. Um, we don't touch on any of that. We, we believe that there's a law of attraction. And so if one aspires to grow and to develop and achieve higher states of consciousness, you're not going to attract anything negative to you. You're going to attract something to you or someone or a spirit or a spirit guide to you that will want to help you to reach your aspirations and grow. And as a, as a consequence, they grow on the other side because it's sort of like the old story of the angel earning his wings. By helping someone here, they move on and they work on their karma there. Which brings me to a uh, concept in spiritualism, and that is the doorway to reformation is never closed against any human soul here or hereafter which basically states that you don't have to, you don't have to make everything right, all, right before you're dead. You have all of eternity to work on it on the other side. It, your, 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 your karma, you take it with you wherever you go. It's like that little character in the Peanuts uh, uh, story, Big Pen. Remember the little cloud he took him with him wherever he went? That's our karma. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad cloud, but it's our karma. So in our churches, we encourage people to bank good karma. You know, do, do some good things on this, on the, in this life. And it will come back to you in this life as well as in the next life. So, Stephen, you've explained how spiritualism is a religion, but could it also be considered a philosophy or a spirituality? Well, um, in the early days of spiritualism, and we're looking at the 1850s um, up to probably the 1930s, um, spiritualism was called a science. Um, the reason being that um, there were countless seances that were being held around the country. 
And scientists were seeing people react very emotionally to this because they were connecting with dead loved ones. So they thought this has got to be fraud. So they would attend the seances in an effort to prove them wrong, only to become followers themselves. So some of the most famous people out there um, are convinced, were convinced spiritualists. So spiritualism was a science to begin with. In the 1930s, uh, J.B. Ryan at Duke University developed the um, concept of extrasensory perception and was able to um, develop um, a test with Carl Zener um, uh, to validly test um, one's psychic abilities. And they found that there, there were people who were getting um, scores on some of these tests that were like billions to one that they could ever guess uh, guess the material. Um, and so they concluded, rightly so, I think, that, okay, if the odds are billions to one that you could guess it intellectually, there must be some other factor. There must be some extrasensory perception that we have. And that can be uh, quantified. Stephen... T uh, tell us a little bit about the Spiritualist Church of New York City. Okay. Um, just back to the science thing. I just want to come back to that for a minute. In the Please. 1930s with J.B. Ryan at Duke University, that's where spiritualism became less of a science. So they, they, the scientists took the phenomenon of spiritualism and took it into the laboratory to study it. As a consequence, spiritualism kind of loosely let go of the science of it and let the scientists deal with it. So remaining uh, mainly was a little bit of science, philosophy, and religion. And so they say that spiritualism is a religion, science, and a philosophy. That's interesting. Is, is there a difference between spiritualism and spiritism? Absolutely, yes. Spiritism, um, uh, it, one of the questions I have here is the primary belief in spiritualism, the belief in spirits. That the answer to that would be no. If you are a spiritist, the answer might be yes. We find spiritists mostly in um, the Caribbean, um, Brazil, uh, and other countries in South America, and it's very popular in Brazil. In some circles, it's called spiritism, uh, which was essentially founded by um, uh, a French um, philosopher, um, whose name escapes me by now. But anyway, um, it's embraced, uh, especially in the Caribbean, they'll call it espiritisto instead of espiritualismo. Um, spiritualism is the term spiritualism, describing essentially the same concepts, is used in the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, um, mostly the English-speaking world. So the difference is that spiritism focuses more on almost... Um, deifying spirits, whereas spiritualism sees um, the spirit world as sort of a hierarchy, um, and that it's spiritual, not just about spirits, but spirit, spiritual as in divinity, if that makes sense. So our focus is more on, on the divine than it is on the individual spirits, but we have a lot of fun visiting with individual spirits, right. and that enhances our spirituality. So, th th which does then raise the question of that, and you know how your religion, if you will, is expressed. And I know that there is something called the Spiritualist Church of New York City. Yes. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. The church was founded in two thousand and seven mm -hmm. um, by myself and a group of my students who had just become ministers. So they had their ordination uh, and immediately had a job. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we decided to start the church. It's based on the principles of the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. And at one of the first board meetings, um, I was the president for the first year. Um, at one of the first board meetings, I brought up the subject, do we want to become a member of the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, which is one of the largest of the spiritual denominations. And I explained what the pros and cons were, and they voted no. They wanted to become an independent church, an independent spiritual church. So the religion and the expression of the religion is identical to what the National Spiritual Association does, but we're not obligated or ruled by them. So it's more, more or less a political decision that the church made. Um, the church is um, 
it's located on at the we hold services at the church of saint paul and saint andrew at 263 west 86th street that's between broadway and west end avenue uh we hold services twice a month on um, monday evenings and um the, the service runs about an hour and then after that we have a message circle in the back of the church and that's uh, usually well attended sometimes we have up to 30 or 40 people so tell us a little bit about uh, what would a service look like do you have sacred texts do you have holidays tell us a little bit more about the church and its its day-to-day spiritual life yeah um when you co- if you were to come to a spiritualist church you would see people a great deal of diversity um and i'm speaking about all kinds of diversity um people from different types of backgrounds religions bringing their own spirituality with them and i think our church is has been set up to sort of help challenge people in their own spirituality to think beyond what they've been taught and not to reject it so much but just to think beyond and then let them make up their own minds um so you walk away with a feeling of acceptance and appreciation for your differences um i remember i one one sunday when we were having services on sunday Uh, I set up um, a table in the vestibule of the church with literature, a sign-up sheet for our mailing list. And um, this nice woman was working with me, and um, she happened to be African-American. And we were sitting there at the table as a team. And um, <clears throat> during the first half hour before the service, service started, lots of white people kept coming in, one after another after another. And she looked over at me and she said, is this a white church? I said just give it a chance just wait and then all of a sudden more people came in um you know Asians and you know people of color i mean it it's you know and sure white people are the majority in this country uh, if you so if you go to our church you're going to see a lot of white people but you're going to see a lot of people of color there as well so i think people walk away feeling like they don't see my face they see my spirit they see my heart uh they don't care about my race they don't care about my previous religion um they care about my spirit and and if i'm calling in from a, around cuz this program goes around this country and it goes around the world um there is an access online for some of the teachings as well is that right yeah um the, the holistic studies institute is uh the educational arm so to speak um we we train the mediums and the ministers and the and uh clairvoyance would all of them we train them and then the church absorbs them and now we have another uh, spiritualist church in Brooklyn so we're we're moving things right along very nicely i hope we have a third church sometime soon the congregation in Brooklyn is is very promising steven what is women's role in the spiritualist church and why is it significant that's my favorite question of today <laughs> <laughs> First of all, my mentor was a woman. She was born in 1887. I met her when she was 89 years old. And um I walked into her studio apartment and she had a chair there and her, her all of her walls were lined with bookcases everywhere. She was a very very well read woman. She taught at the Morris Pratt Institute. Um and I thought this is this woman is like a sage, you know. Um and she said i've been waiting for someone to come along who will help me to start a church because i'm too old i said oh, okay well and i i hadn't given a lot of thought but she encouraged me to do it and i did and that's how holistic studies institute started as a church and evolved into a, a school um women um the women that i've worked with who have been co-pastors with me um all my co-pastors have been women um spiritualism when it began in the 18 1848 actually um they were fighting for women's rights they were suffragettes um many of them spoke out at lilydale new york um which is uh it was used to be the association of free thinkers and now it's become a community of spiritualists so um we were the first religion uh to support the abolition of slavery and to come public with that we were the first religion um to ordain well I'm not sure we were the first religion to ordain ministers uh, but women were ordained as ministers um back in the 1930s and 40s um and she was an ordained spiritualist minister 
Um, so women have a very important role in the spiritualist church. Um, we, you might say we even have like church mothers. I mean, they're like, um, you know, our, we owe them a lot. We owe them a lot. Yeah. I think the men, uh, the male ministers that started spiritualism, um, uh, it was more male dominated at that point uh, in the early years. And then as, as it evolved, uh, more women became involved. So it's a, an extremely liberal religion, very progressive and open. Even we're slowly coming to the end of our time together. And I know Renee had a question uh, that might help many of our viewers. Yes. Where can people go if they'd like to learn more about spiritualism? Uh, well, they could go to the Spiritualist Church that I just gave you the address for. Um, uh, or they could come to Holistic Studies Institute, enroll in one of our intuitive development classes, and you're essentially getting spiritualism in the class. Um, we don't teach, uh, we don't stress so much the religious part of it, because we don't want to offend people who are just, look, I'm just here to learn how to be psychic. I don't want to learn about a religion. Um, but they're going to get the principles of it because it follows the principles of mediumship and psychic development. So by coming to a class, uh, by coming to a message circle is a good way to start to see how other people work and how they do this. And it sort of gives you a sample of it, as I said earlier. So tell us a little bit uh, about the Holistic Studies Institute. Here's a place where folks could conceivably learn more about spiritualism. Um, tell us a little more about that institute that you helped found. Um, yeah, I've been teaching since 76. Um, and I've learned so much about um, life, you know, and, and what is beyond life and what is beyond visible. Um, so I've, I've grown a lot uh, through uh, the institute itself by teaching. Um, I guess the best way to answer that question is that um, one day I was at the spiritualist church and I was, in, I was doing a lecture and afterward we were going to give messages to the congregation, which is essentially, oh, I have a reading for you, this is from your mother or whatever. Um, and I was working with someone who had been a student, who had been ordained, and she had been out there for a while. And when she came up to the platform before the service, she said, I don't know if I can give messages, I haven't done it in a long time. I said, well, I know you can, and you know you can. I said, but why don't I start, get the ball rolling, and while I'm working, you see if you can get a message. So she did. And after the service, she said to me, she said, there's something I want to say to you. She said, you have changed my life in a way that you'll never know for the better. And I don't know. I believe what she says, but I don't know that because I don't see that. But she left her corporate job um, and she has a full-time job now as a psychic medium, and she's a spiritualist minister. So um, I think that the best way to start is start out slowly, take little baby steps, see how, if you feel comfortable with it, and then proceed from there. Okay. We create such a safe environment. You'll feel like you're in, a, like you're a baby in an incubator. <laughs> And Stephen, I, I have so enjoyed working with you and, and wholeheartedly recommend it for people who are in the New York, New York area. If one of our listeners is in California or London or somewhere else, what might be a way that they get started? Well, my suggestion is, first of all, uh, read. Go online, um, get some books, uh, go to Amazon, get, get some basic exposure to it. Um, and then seek out and Google spiritualism in your city, town, country. There are spiritualist churches all over the world, um, all over in Europe, South America, Central America, the US, Canada, they're in Australia, uh, South Africa. I mean, they're, they're, it's a worldwide religion. Uh, so wherever anyone is in the world, they ought to be able to find some uh, degree of spiritualism, whether it's just someone, some nice, couple that are having uh, seances in their home and they're welcome they're, they welcome you in uh it could be that informal or it could be as formal as having um the berkeley psychic institute um in the bay area for example where they have a graduated program just like we do um so it de depends on your area and the degree of um i guess sophistication of the psychics in the area 
Stephen, thank you so very, very much. This has been such a rich conversation. There is no doubt in my mind that we will be inviting you back many, many, many more times so that we can explore many more elements um, to this magnificent path and frankly, to your gifts. Well, so thank you. thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge, your wisdom with all of us. Well, I think we're all gifted and I want to say thank you very much. It's been a distinct pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Reverend Renee, Bishop Heather, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to doing this with both of you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to our, our listeners and our viewers, thank you. Indeed, to all our listeners and all our viewers, indeed, thank you. And we look forward to joining with you again to explore the world's wisdom in open heart conversations. Take care.